Bill, let's hear from some friends and some who are not so friendly who have commented on your work. I don't see myself as not friendly. I think I'm a pretty friendly guy. I just don't think your ideas are true. And so if you consider an idea something that divides you from being a friend with somebody, I don't know how you're going to make it in this world that's just full of different ideas. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. As one does, or at least as I do, I was walking my dog listening to William Lane Craig's latest Reasonable Faith podcast episode. I don't listen to Craig's podcast, and I don't, I don't even know anybody who does, and so you were the only person that came to me and said, hey, William Lane Craig responded to you, what are you going to say? When I heard a familiar voice, this time it was Derek from Myth Vision Podcast, a YouTube channel that is exploding right now. After years of putting in the hard work, I sent Derek a message, and he knew nothing about it. I did not. You're the only person who told me. It's kind of interesting. I was telling my wife, and she's just like, wow, the tables have completely turned. I loved him. He was an idol of mine. This guy was undefeated in my eyes. Here I am now thinking I have some stuff that they should learn. Well, it's great to finally have you on. Let's see what Craig had to say. Next up is Dr. Richard C. Miller on the Myth Vision podcast. We are Myth Vision. Richard Miller is a humanistic scholar of Christian origins in the ancient Hellenistic and Roman world. And he did graduate study at Princeton Theological Seminary, Yale, and UCLA, completing his Ph.D. in religion in 2013 at Claremont Graduate University School of Religion in L.A., just in case uh, you want some background on him. Notice the context that he just introduced Rick, and I love it. I'm already loving this, Paul, because he's painting the context. We are talking about a scholar who specializes in the world, the milieu, the zeitgeist in which Christianity was birthed. Who better to ask on the origins of Christianity than this guy? Let's see what he has to say on that podcast. Take a look. Dr. Miller, you have gone from evangelical fundamentalist type thinking to where you are today. So apologetics, geez, um, this is one of those things that you know what it is, but I'm such a fan, you can already tell. <laughs> in the academic circles that you roll in, they don't even pay attention to this. I see it because I live in a world where I'm trying to filter good, what I call ivory tower scholars that are like the legit top, top, top academics and bring them down to our world. In that world, we have people who make it their career in life to go to institutions to prove and defend. Notice I'm contextualizing my question to Rick Miller. This is important. I'm distinguishing in my own question, high academics, like really serious top-notch scholars. And then I'm already talking about others, scholars in quotes, that are coming into these institutions or trying to go and make a career out of defending Jesus and Christianity as if it's really true. I am dichotomizing here, and we're going to get further into this episode. You're going to see why. But like, I already know there are people who are selling you a car, oftentimes a lemon, and then I have some people who say, listen, I have a product that I know is good, whether you want it or not. You're going to need this if you're going to try and maneuver and drive and whatnot. So I don't need to try to sell it to you. You either want it or you don't. And this is the academic <laughs> world. From what I see of your channel, that was a pretty good mission statement summary of what Myth Vision is all about. Yeah, it's also a reflection of my previous testimony, if you can call it that. I went from the William Lane Craig's, the Robbie Zacharias. I went from the various apologetic literature, movies. I worked at a Christian bookstore. I sold these things to Christians. I was in church. I was headed into ministry to become a pastor one day. Went to Christian college, the whole nine. And I was actually in that vein. If I would have had a podcast, I'd have been emailing William Lane Craig, Robbie Zacharias to interview them. But what happened through the years, through learning, through growing my entire mind on this material, I've started to go down this avenue and realized there's a difference between what they are doing and what historical academics are doing. Jesus and Christianity as if it's really true, Jesus really rose from the dead, and there are scholars, I'll put in quotations, mm -hmm. who make it their job 
to write books and, and argue for Jesus. They debate people like Bart Ehrman. They debate people to try and like argue that Jesus is real. As an academic who has that past, but where you are now, how do scholars see this field of apologetics if they even see it at all? What what is tell me about apologetics from the angle of real serious <sighs> academia? Well, it's largely ignored. I, I don't know. I mean, when I was at Yale and Princeton and those places, uh, it, there was no discussion of that. There, I they wouldn't know who William Lane Craig is. You know, I, I could talk to most. I, I went to Biola University. I, I met with James Charlesworth. That was where I did my master's degree. He said, "Where did you do your 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 prior work?" And I told him Biola. He said, "Bio what?" He had no idea what that was. That's William Lane Craig's, you know, academy there. He had no idea what it was. It's it's not even on the radar, really. Oh, man. There's so much to say. If you've seen his face when I interviewed Rick on this, he's enthusiastic on this topic. And yeah, it's mostly ignored. If someone heard about it, and most probably haven't, the ones who heard about it have probably went, mm. yeah, people who come out of that area, they become what he calls poop throwing. He's going to say that it's just rhetoric poop throwing or it's either that if you're in the apologetics arena to defend publicly like the Frank Turek types and these kind of guys or you go the other avenue of just being a minister or in the ministry in some way and you're interested in this lifestyle of giving to the church and stuff. Many Christians go to these conservative Christian colleges to get their PhDs, to become experts in Christianity, to understand the Gospels. But I'd say 99.9%, if not all of them, go on a faith mission. They're not doing this as an academic pursuit purely. They're coming into it from a faith-based perspective. Which is borne out in their enrollment policy. I actually pursued getting a master's degree at Biola and I couldn't even apply without first signing a statement of faith saying that I would arrive already agreeing with them before the first day. They consider that to be public kind of poop throwing and, and debate that has to, you know, it's kind of a kind of a circus of spectacle. It's r rhetorical and not really, you know, meeting any of the standards of rigor that they would find helpful in, in their circles. Hmm. Yeah. So technically apologetics is kind of a joke to the serious scholars in terms of well it's a fundamental violation of our own kind of methodologies you're starting with the answers before you even know the questions and that that's a, a offensive in every way to the kind of the the entire methodological approach of higher academics well bill i i couldn't resist and i accused him in the comments of that video when i saw it of doing apologetics against apologetics oh my gosh okay if we're going to be technical on the definition of apologist it's simply a person who offers an argument in defense of something controversial according to you know dictionary online oxford but we all know what an apologist is. Okay, this is someone who literally makes it their duty to defend their particular faith view. And we don't need to get into, is atheism some type of worldview and is this something that we need to defend? That's irrelevant to me. You could be agnostic, you could be theist, you can be atheist, you could be whatever you want. But what they're doing is starting with their answer, just like you had to sign your faith waiver in, in order to even go to these schools. They're not starting with the question. And this is the investigation that is against the methodology, Richard, and those ivory tower scholars I bring on my show and you've been bringing on yours, Paul. They want the questions. They don't scratch the answers. The answers come after you've investigated, not, oh, I had a warm, fuzzy when Bill Craig was a young boy and he found out that God came down and sent his son, if this has one in a million chance of being true, hallelujah, it's worth believing in. And that day, Bill Craig gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he was a teenager. This guy had no clue the vast critical scholarship that was out there and understanding the broader world and context in which the birth of Christianity occurred. He had no way. But once you sell them, once you are emotionally vested, like you're going to defend a parent, your parent can do wrong. I've found myself doing this. I've been guilty. It's tribalistic in a way. My parent can do wrong. My brother can do something wrong. And I will still fight and defend him most of the time. Naturally, just comes natural. 
once you have the key to a heavenly father who could solve all your problems, that gives you this gift of heaven, this promise of salvation with the sealed Holy Spirit, you then are vested in, you're sold. And once you sell, you're no longer questioning that foundation. You're just figuring out what's the proper understanding, what's the proper furniture that goes in this house we call Christianity. How do I organize that furniture? Are the Arminians correct? Are the Orthodox Christians correct? I have Christian scholars who cannot stand apologetics. They despise Christian apologetics, and they love their faith, and they do historical critical research on New Testament, on early Christianity, on early church fathers, on Old Testament, you name it. But it, all right, it just sounds like one big personal attack. What do you think about what he yeah. said? Well, I think that Miller's remarks should be a real wake-up call for Christians. This is so beautiful. I love that William Lane Craig is saying the right things here. This should be a wake-up call for all the Christians. You bet you it should, Christians. Pay attention. Listen. Because these scholars do think that it is poop-throwing, clown, not serious research, not serious academia. I love that Craig is conceding. He's giving so much ground right now and just recognizing the problem. Because he accurately reflects the attitude of secular academics toward us as evangelicals. And it is very true that in his community or subculture, apologetics is a dirty word. It connotes bias, close-mindedness, dogmatism, so that although among Christians, apologetics is a traditional, respected theological curriculum. If you paused every sentence that Craig is saying here, he's very careful about his wordings. Apologetics among Christians has been a respected theological thing. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but I want us to get outside of our bubble. That's what right. Myth is all about. For people like Miller, it's offensive. And therefore, when I'm introduced on a secular campus, I feel very uncomfortable when the moderator introduces me as a great Christian apologist. He thinks he's paying me a compliment, when in fact, in the eyes of the listeners, this is actually uh, an insult. It's nice to see Dr. Craig with some self-awareness. It's interesting because when I was a Christian, I saw it as a compliment. But hearing him say that, I think that is kind of a self-confession of like, why do you feel by hearing that people are going to think of you and go, all right, here's this guy, what I titled the original video that this is coming from, telemarketer for Jesus. <laughs> and it has Craig's face on it. So, you know, you're up there defending the position no different than the Muslim, no different than the Hindu apologist that are doing it for their faith position is the point. And it's also true what he says that evangelicals are generally not read by these secular scholars. Why? Why? Why aren't secular scholars taking these evangelicals serious? And why aren't they going to them? Why aren't their endless bibliographies listing those names of their sources, their works? Why are people sourcing Lydia McGrew. I'll tell you why, just to give you her. She's a fundamentalist in my, my estimation. At the very beginning of one of her books, she literally tells you, I don't care about any other sources but the New Testament. And I'm literally only going off of that within this Christian bubble. I have a scholar that I'm, I'm going to release in public here, Jeffrey Tripp. He's going to be coming on. He's the one who took apart the eyewitness stuff of Bauckham, which we're going to get into here. He's dissected Bauckham's eyewitness stuff on the Gospel of John. That's not even talking about Hugo Mendez, who's also showing that authors who are looking for the history behind John are just digging in the wrong soil. Mm -hmm. They have no clue what they're doing. They're not reading this material as literature. They're thinking this is history. They're thinking this is really what happened. How absurd would you be to go read Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey or some other legendary material that has realisms, what they call verisimilitude, but you're actually just trying to find history? You know, okay, uh, around here, Achilles fought against Troy. Here, <laughs> Get out of here, guys. Like, it's narrative. It's symbolism. It's theology. They're doing other kind of work. So Jeffrey Tripp's going to come on and dissect this using some of her own methodology to show that Heracles would fit this criteria. 
everybody get ready to start worshiping Heracles and start worshiping some of the Greco-Roman deities because we're about to make some apologetics for them. When you go away to do a doctoral degree at a secular university, you suddenly discover that all of your evangelical heroes are very big fish in a very small pond and that they're largely unheard of outside that little pond. I 100% agree. <laughs> Whenever I have a scholar on to respond to an apologist, I ask if they've heard of the apologist. Usually the answer is no. Do you know Professor Michael Heiser? You know, if I do know him, I don't remember that I know him. <laughs> Are you familiar with Jay Warner Wallace at all? Only because you've made me familiar with him modestly. And Who's the first person, just out of curiosity? You don't know Christian apologist Frank Turek? Why is that? It's because they are big fish in a very small pond. And this is a wake-up call, again, as Bill Craig says, you know, William Lane Craig, you need to keep that pond having plenty of water because there's an ocean, not a pond, of solid scholarship that's out there that is bringing great information. I do not think that they're all correct on so many points. I mean, I could probably find something I personally disagree with with almost any academic that I've ever interviewed. But that big ocean, it's not only enormous, but it's going to swallow up that little pond if you don't keep your little bubble there. But I can tell you this, those big fish in that little pond will never influence the ocean's fish. They will never make the impact. The larger academic world is not even aware of these fish, and they don't care. And that these secular scholars don't read books that are published by Zondervan and Moody and Crossway uh, and so forth. And that is why, Kevin, Christian scholarship is so important. Both Nicholas Wolterstorff and Robert Adams taught at Yale, where Miller says he had never heard of or interacted with Christian scholars. I think that he just did a bait and switch here. We started off with apologists. Now it's turned into just any Christian scholars. And Richard C. Miller, admittedly, he confesses to himself. He says, hey, I am on the full secular humanist critical side. And I think that faith-based research scholarship is just not going to get you the answers. Because if you're a Christian who believes Jesus really did rise from the dead, that's part of something you believe. You can't not believe it. You believe it. And he didn't rise from the dead. Then how can you be accurate if he didn't rise? Let's say the answer was he didn't rise from the dead, but you believe he did. How can you come to the conclusion that he didn't if you have to believe that in your mind? Like it's something that you aren't challenging. You're not interested in actually finding out the truth on or not. And what makes the most sense here? The scholars he's naming here are philosophers. Irrelevant to the field that we're talking about here, but these are philosophers. And even Miller has said to me, he thinks that Yale in many cases is very conservative because they're actually raising ministers. A lot of mm. Yale, Princeton, you know, Del C. Allison Jr., he's over For at sure. Yale. They are raising ministers. They're not asking these tougher, hard questions in many cases. Stephen T. Davis was an eminent professor at Claremont, where Miller did his Ph.D. Christian philosophers like Alvin Plantinga, William Alston, Philip Quinn were elected as presidents of the American Philosophical Association. And as for scholars in Miller's own field, is he unfamiliar with N.T. Wright? Craig Evans, Richard Burridge, Richard Baucom. Wow. I'm glad he's bringing this up. And I get this little chance to mention N.T. Wright, Craig Evans, Richard Burridge, Richard Baucom. These are scholars that in the upper echelon of scholarship I'm talking about, let's talk about the Paula Fredricksons. Let's talk about Richard C. Miller. Let's talk about Bart Ehrman. Let's talk about Elaine Pagels. Let's talk about these scholars who are like, the top tier leading kind of in their avenue of expertise. And then there are others who may not be as popular. I'm naming some popular names here, like scholars like M. David Litwa that I've had on and several other academics I bring on all the time. Robin Faith Walsh, the list can go on. These scholars have maybe heard of N.T. Wright, but they do not have fondness of them. And I brought a few quotes from a review from Paula Fredrickson. But before I read them, I need to tell you a little context. Okay. No one has interviewed Paula Fredrickson. I was lucky enough to make history. And I went and I flew to Boston and I interviewed Paula. 
I sent her questions in advance so she could prepare. Some of those questions had this guy named N.T. Wright in them. And when I entered into her apartment to interview her, her first words were, can we save those for last? I don't want to ruin my day. Oh. oh, oh. Do I need to interpret that? I think you understand. Why did she review his book? Well, he just mentioned these scholars aren't reading evangelicals. Her college commissioned or told her, we need you to review this Paul and the Faithfulness of God book by N.T. Wright. It's like a 1,600-page tomb of work, okay? Like, mm -hmm. huge book. She writes in this section after quoting some of his very realized eschatology type of material that he tries to say about Paul, master of agnostic rhetoric, quote, Wright scolds those who disagree with him. They think anachronistically. This is asserted, not demonstrated, she says. Wright thinks historically. They are befogged by political correctness, especially the post-Holocaust variety. You know, what happened after the war and what happened in World War II, their sensitivities surrounding how Jews are treated, a minority group who's been so many conspiracy theories surrounding these people who are being like really treated bad. So rightly so, people have sensitivities, but this is his point. And then he says, they do not attend to the plain sense of the text, right does, according to right. Or they read only the plain sense of the text, not the understanding that it's true meaning. Always for Paul must be metaphorical. So when it doesn't work for right, because they're not reading the true plain sense of the text, when they do read the true plain sense of the text, scholars, right's reading it metaphorical and saying, you're not understanding Paul. Or mm. finally, they are a guild who wear their fringes long and their phylacteries wide. Hypocrites, Pharisees, Jews. These are quotes from his book about other scholars. He's pitting himself against the scholars in there, doing his own apologetic, painting it in historical research. If they disagree with Wright's non-apocalyptic construction of Perusia, fun as these polemics are, and Wright throughout is in full high table voice, they account for much of the book's bloat. Less might have been more, she said. Here's where really she spearheads his realized eschatology. But what about all those cosmic powers in Paul? Every arche and exusia and dynamis, whom the victorious returning Christ had yet to defeat. Because Wright thinks that he has fulfilled it in Christ and the church, and he like completely replaces Israel with Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, the theos of, the a of this aeon, who was blinding the minds of unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The archai and dynamis that groan along with all creation, Romans 8, 38. The resurrection of the dead and transformation of the living, which Paul thought he would live to see. And she gives the quotes, the references. Aren't these hopes, well, apocalyptic? Wouldn't the day after the day of the Lord Jesus Christ look a little different from the day before? Is it really metaphors all the way down, transposed into a realized Christological key? Or is Paul talking about something actually, historically, indeed, empirically happening within the time-space world? And wasn't he conceiving of this occurring sometime in the middle decades of what we now call the first century? In his certitude about this, thus Paul's vision of inaugurated eschatology, Wright uses, and for the whole length of his 1,660 pages, Wright manages not to say. To say the least, Paula is not happy. She did not enjoy reading that book. She was not a fan of it at all. And nobody in these higher upper echelon of scholars are even really referencing him, maybe in a bibliography on something on a side note, but sure. most likely to critique like, oh, this guy, here's that guy over here that does this. It's not thumbs up, great work. You're pioneering something new and actually changing the ideas of minds of academics because your scholarship is so rigorous and accurate. You could literally say the same going into Craig Evans, Richard Bauckham. They're coming at it so historical and trying to say, anchor it into reality of what actually happened that they're missing that liberty of literature that has metaphor, that has symbolism, and it's not historical on those bases. So there's verisimilitude. You can find people, places, and things that are there, but just because a senator in a certain region that ruled for three years or whatever it might be doesn't mean the guy walked on water or was stoned to death and resurrected from the dead or somehow handkerchiefs are causing people to come back to life or healed of their leprosy or the list goes on and on. That's just silly. 
to make those kind of jumps because you could do the same thing in Homer with his writings on the Odyssey, the Iliad. You can find this stuff in the Greco-Roman world. There are real people, real places, and real things. And then there's some, hold on, Hermes walked on water with his golden slippers? I believe that's true. Exactly. <laughs> there's so much more I could add to this. I mean, endlessly, my point is, I could probably find stuff in some of these scholars that I would agree with, and I'd give a thumbs up. But most of the academics I'm talking to are saying, they are putting on this, I'm doing real rigorous historical research under the facade of theological, faith-based rigor. They have an agenda to really make this be the case and convince others this is true kind of thing. There are some Christians that are scholars I interview that aren't. And they're like, listen, I have a personal faith. I choose this path. I'm doing historical research. They find problems left and right. They have no problem saying contradictions. There's the text don't agree. Uh, I don't even know if that's the case. That could be false. I don't think Jesus said those words. Jesus was wrong about the apocalypse. Christians, I don't understand it personally, Paul, and I'm sure you don't either, but there are Christian scholars who say Jesus was wrong. Can William Lane Craig say that? Can he say that Jesus got the end wrong? I very much doubt he can. And if he did, what would happen? What would happen to him if he did? These people are universally respected. They're not all universally respected on the same level. And I'm not saying that, you know, there's nothing they contribute to the field of research. Of course, they have engagement from some of the great scholars I interview. But if you look at that engagement on their work overall, the scholars that I talk to, like Jeffrey Tripp, like Paula Fredrickson, Dennis McDonald, and other scholars, they all are finding so many holes in looking at Richard Bauckham's work, for example. They see this and they go, sounds like this guy needs and really wants this to be historically the case with these names to help him drive kind of a faith-based perspective. He's very conservative in his estimations and his trying to make this as historically true and reliable as possible. And the scholars that I have come on, they've read his works. They dissect his works. The eyewitnesses of John diving deep into the names, how these names supposedly give more historical credibility to the names being mentioned in the Gospels. But Craig doesn't factor in the invention of some of the names that may be in the Gospels, as Dennis McDonald has pointed out. His criteria and his methodology doesn't factor in some of those names. All I'm saying is, is these scholars in the ocean see people like Richard Bauckham, who are respected more than N.T. Wright. They see their works as conservative and almost behind in the time that we're living in now in terms of the scholarship we're looking at. Most scholars are heading toward the direction that these Gospels are literature, not historical eyewitnesses, reportage, all that kind of stuff. That is the stuff the apologists need and really want. Why? Because of verisimilitude. There's realisms. This person, this place is real. This person's real. Therefore, walk on water. Therefore, all of these other claims that are in these Gospels are reliable for these kind of things. So they're using things that are mundane, like names and other things, to try and give credibility to the literature. And then they make the leap to the miraculous, which is not a far leap for them because they already factored into the worldview. However, they're not consistent when they start factoring in all the other miraculous claims and worldview things. They always find ways to shut that down and... Even if you show them examples, I'm sure it's still not going to convince them of anything that might be close or contemporaneous with claims, miracles, deities, ascensions, death, post-mortem appearances, you name it. They'll find some way to still have Christianity be the case. So that just rabbit trolled off of these scholars. I need to make that point that they're not all treated the same because not all their work is the same. Even though those fish like Richard Bauckham that go to the pond and thumbs up the apologist go to the ocean, they are taken serious to analyze their work. They're not accepted, though, in the sense that these scholars are like, we're convinced of what his case is. That's my point. So there you have it. I think it's fair to say that within Craig's analogy, he's still just referencing fish in the same small pond. Not any names from the bigger ocean of academia. The weird part about this analogy is that these are fish who can somehow traverse into salty waters and they visit the pond. I mean, Richard Bauckham literally gave a thumbs up review to Lydia McGrew's work. So what's happening here? You got a guy who's being said universally, you know, acknowledged and good. Maybe he does something good in his work that might be, oh, okay, well, that's good. But 
they're not thinking of Richard Bauckham like that. They're not out here going, N.T. Wright is not on the forefront of their thoughts. They're probably going, did you see the new publication by Elaine Pagels? Did you see the new thing by Candida Moss? Did you check out Joel Baden's new thing on the Hebrew Bible? Have you checked out what John J. Collins just wrote about in the particulars of the Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures, or the Dead Sea Scrolls? Have you been analyzing the cutting edge academia on these particular topics? They're not those forefront. So I, I'm not trying to poison the well. Please do not take this as like they don't have something to contribute. But N.T. Wright for sure, because I know I've read his works and not all of them, but I've read a lot of his works and the reviews against them. He is theologically motivated painting it as if he's doing historical research, but it's faith driven and it, it is confessional based. Now, Miller's comments on methodology, I think, are quite naive. Academics who have studied an issue at length and then come to certain conclusions may hold them very passionately and start with their viewpoint and then lay out a case for what they believe. Oh, man, Paul. <laughs> I mean, get me a list, Dr. Craig of non-believing, secular, atheist, agnostic, you know, whatever, non-believing people that end up going in to research this material, not through a faith base, they didn't go to church, they're not making some testimony up in their books like Josh McDowell has about how he became a Christian. They are actual non-believers. They go down the avenue of researching the vast Greco-Roman world, like Richard C. Miller's pointed out, They've learned to realize all of the various miraculous claims, the various deities in antiquity that had their own cultic mystery schools, cultic beliefs, Asclepius, the list goes on and on. Walking away going, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. This is the one true one. This is the point. The way he worded that, he is a very good rhetorician. He is so good at words and getting you to not see what he did, in my opinion, or he does it to himself because he just made it sound like, oh, they study this stuff. Then they're confident in their conclusion. That they studied to that point and then they defend it. He's literally trying to say, that's us apologist. Craig, we know your story. We know you were a young teen who was emotionally, I'm going to use the word gullible. I was a young kid who needed a father that loved him because my dad was an alcoholic. And I struggled with that love, but I ended up walking down that aisle and went down and gave my life to Jesus and listened to you, sir, for several years of my life. You were my hero. You were the Christian apologist guy that was in front. And I saw you as undefeated, someone who cannot be wrong on these issues. Little did I realize there's a whole nother world that I didn't know about that I discovered. And it wasn't in a pond. It was in an ocean. And now that I'm actually looking at this, I realize I started with my faith. And because it was such an impact, I defended it. And I, I wanted to find the answers to really help myself stay. I think it was Paul Tillich or somebody who mentioned that why is the apologist on the war path? They're going into a war with themselves. They're actually fighting the two battles inside, convincing themselves that what they believe is not wrong or dumb. So they're actually trying to prove it to themselves and therefore others that, hey, we, we could still keep believing in the magic show. For example, I've recently been studying evolutionary biology, and Jerry Coyne from the University of Chicago, for example, wrote a book called Why Evolution is True, and similar books uh, of that ilk will lay out a case for what they already believe is the truth. I mean, Paul, we saw on Joe Rogan, yep. the, recent, the recent biologist who went on, the creationist biologist. Stephen Meyer, yep. Yeah. How is he viewed amongst biologists in the field? Do you think they quote Stephen Meyer? Do you think they're putting him in their bibliography on how to understand how biology works or anything in the, the mechanisms they work within? No. He's probably fringe. He's probably someone they don't even know about till they saw him on an interview here on Joe Rogan's podcast. This is what apologetics is. Axe grinding. It's not... Let's really accurately assess this information. Even Justin Martyr, which, by the way, modern apologists disagree with earliest apologists on how to answer these things. Mm. Justin Martyr says, we believe nothing different. In fact, I'd like to read a quote from Richard C. Miller that he sent me on this whole debacle. Apologists have been falsely seeking 
to distinguish the post-mortem accounts of Jesus from the Penelope of translation legends from classical antiquity, 600 BCE to 500 CE. That's all. That's literally almost a thousand years. Mm. Of the many distinctions claimed, most are false. Proximity and time being perhaps the most mistaken, along with reliability of source. Indeed, regarding the latter, no reputable historian attested to the raised ascended Jesus. Unlike coverage of so many of the other figures by foremost historians of antiquity, worse still, we find only internal cultic writers presenting such Christian claims. Justin wrote to the emperor Antoninus, Pius, around 150 CE, moreover that there was nothing new about their exaltation narratives regarding Jesus with respect to any other demigod legends of antiquity. The stories were same in kind, even if favored by their acolytes. So while he compares them and says, look, we're doing the same thing, but our Jesus is the true one, they still have to forfeit that ground because they knew that material so well, you couldn't pretend it wasn't in common with the Greco-Roman mythic legendary topos of the day. They appear to confuse cultural adaptation with genuine formal distinction of veracity. Imagine a street performer named Juan in Mexico City who pulls a rabbit out of sombreros in front of a large crowd. Then 2,000 years later, the Juanites become confronted with the historical reality of magic acts and the trope of the rabbit out of the top hat. They then insist, no, Juan had real magical powers and that none of those other accounts were written up in the Mexico City newspaper or were attended by such large enthusiastic crowds. The conventional cultural grammar determines the correct cultural semiotic interpretation. To overcome this, the earliest Christians would have needed to work day and night to distinguish such an alleged ontological claim, which we see absent in early Christian thought, end quote. He says the analogy falls apart, but he just says such claims of actual translation were across the board cultic claims, not the public claims of those vested presenting ontological reality, the history writers. When historians of classical antiquity shared a translation fable, they typically did so under some modal interlude or disclaimer. Some say that in order to signal for their readers that the given tell was to be taken as a yarn, folk belief, or cultic legend. I was just reading Dionysus of Halicarnassus. I was reading Livy on Romulus. And he literally says, well, whether you believe in such tales, such fabuli or fable, mm -hmm. you know, they tell you, they disclaim you. The Gospels want you to swallow it whole. They are selling you cultic material. It is not historical. They are not giving you, well, you know, some say this and some say that and you should, well, we're not right. sure which is the case. No, 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 no. They want you to go, we are writing this about the genesis of the Son of God who rose from the dead that you might have faith in him, blah, blah, blah. It's okay. And they don't need to affect a position of neutrality and pretend that they've come to no conclusions. Rather, they lay out their case fairly and honestly that they find convincing. And that's exactly the same thing that can be done by the Christian apologist. What do you think? Is the presumption of evolution in biology the same as the presumption of God by an apologist? No, there's several problems. I mean, I could see a young earth creationist who doesn't believe in evolution going in and being convinced based on the evidence that evolution is true. I've never met an evolution believer that goes into school, college to investigate and research evolution and walk away and go, actually, you know, the earth's 7,000 years old and biology, we just got it all wrong, guys. Uh, uh, forget all of the fossil record, scratch genetics. Look, we're actually only 7,000 years old on this planet. It doesn't happen that way. The same way I'm saying, Dr. Craig, get me that list of scholars that were going into their research, not at your Christian conservative college, but I'm talking about actual research of critical scholarship using historical methodology, who based on the evidence and data, walk away going, I am fully convinced, and now I'm going to defend this faith and be someone who's going to go out arguing against others who don't. Show me anyone who turned into an apologist who started off and did this rigorous research going that path. I can get you endless 
endless testimonies where I can show you the other is the case. The reverse is true. They always go that path. And I'd be lucky if you could get me one name. Get me one. And I'd be like, wow, this is definitely the exception and not the rule. So I think Miller's remarks on methodology are simply fundamentally mistaken. And his remarks on Christian scholarship, I think, should simply fire us to be a factor in the broader community in our various areas uh, of specialization. He's saying, Christians, we need to pull together. We got to figure out something different. That's the way I interpret Craig. He's going, our playbook is not working, obviously. And maybe I can help him with that. Maybe I, as someone who was once a follower of Bill Craig to someone who thinks he's mistaken now, but I have no ill intent toward the guy himself. I just think he's putting himself through these acrobatics unnecessarily. The number one thing you can do to convince someone of your kind of philosophy and your worldview is how you behave and how you act. If you're out there putting on shows to condemn and poo-poo other ideas, and we can go to show that your arguments just don't, it's faith, okay? Here we are again, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And when you are out here on the front lines acting like, how do you not see it? Just read your New Testament. Just believe in this. It's so obvious. He rose from the dead. Like when you make those kind of cases, you you look like a salesman. And this is what I think is happening. My advice would be tone it down on that that level. Live a good life as a Christian. Love people. And you're not going to necessarily go out and win everybody in the world. But if you're wanting to be taken serious, you got to get along in the same avenues and not try to go in there with your particular one. Imagine it wasn't a Christian. It's a Muslim scholar. I try to get people to think outside of their box and imagine it's someone else from a worldview because in reality, that's exactly what several people in different faiths are doing. And the apologist ones that are doing that, the fight, argue for their view, they're not taken serious even in Western scholarship on Islamic studies. They're not really being quoted. They're not the bibliographies. No one has an interest in quoting them. The only things you'll find oftentimes in those bibliographies are the ancient exegetes that might have been apologists in some ways, but they have to source them because there's no other sources. They're hundreds of years after the Quran and they have nothing else to go off of. So they have to source these guys to understand and recreate and contextualize early Islam. My point is, is I just think take the car salesman stuff out of it. Stop trying to push it. But it's hard to when you think you're going to burn forever if you don't believe. It's almost fundamentally a immoral thing if they aren't doing what they're doing. That's the hard part. So either have it be successful and change your game or keep doing what you're doing and just watch the numbers continue to dwindle as they are. I have been inspired in my work by the vision of Charles Malik uh, in his essay, The Two Tasks of Christian Scholarship. Malik emphasized that as Christian scholars, we have two tasks. One is winning the heart, and the other is winning the mind. And it is absolutely vital that Christian scholars begin to take back lost ground at the university and to begin to reclaim it again uh, and make Christianity a, a viable option for intellectually respectable thinking men and women. You know I'm a naturalist. You know I identify as an atheist. Pigeonhole me, if you will, okay? I'm not an axe grinding, trying to make everyone turn into an atheist like me. That's not my motive. Okay. But at the end of the day, I value fiction. I value symbolism. I value narrative. And when I read the Gospels, for what I see these authors doing, in many cases, if I'm not reading bad motives, like Luke's opening chapter where it tries to pretend like we're writing actually what actually happened and factual, let's just pretend that wasn't originally there and someone tacked it on because some scholars actually do argue that was added later. Right. And I read these as cultic, legendary narratives, fanciful, fun, powerful stories about a guy named Jesus who's divine. Like I'm reading in the Greek and Roman world, Asclepius, Heracles, Romulus, whoever the figure might be that had a lesson, moral teachings, things like that, one of the philosophers. I can walk away from that like I'm watching Lord of the Rings, like I'm watching some fictional thing, and I can take the good, and then some of that immoral stuff, I can throw it out, and I can enjoy it. That's why I enjoy people like John Dominic Crossan, who believes in God, is literally condemned by most Christians who are on the evangelical sure. side. But he goes, 
you know, people who read this stuff literally and think this is literally true, they're missing the point. And if Christians started going down that less inerrant, infallible, less literal, has to be history angle and realize maybe there is some history, maybe there's a lot of legend, and took that, that's an educated angle. That's actually a respectable angle to being a Christian. And there are scholars that I've interviewed who are Christians who take that angle and yet still hold their faith. If Christians did that more, I think they'd feel like they have less of a chip on their shoulder to go out and force the world into their particular worldview, but also will not be frowned upon and looked at as flat earth types among academics. My two cents. Take up an offering and give an invitation. We can go home after that, Bill. <laughs> that is so true. Funny. Because I was thinking your last answer, Derek, needed an amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not actually here to plug anything or sell anything today. But I do think people should know that you're also the man behind the amazing course catalog starting to grow at MVP Courses. So Myth Vision started this MVP Courses Online to get you those scholars that I really value and want to hear from and learn from and bring them to your computer screen in a way that isn't just an interview, but an actual class. It's like you're actually sitting in Yale, Harvard, Princeton, whatever the institute is that the particular scholar goes to, and you're being taught by them. And it's not just atheist, not just agnostics. There are theist scholars. There's Christian scholar Dale C. Allison Jr. We have it all, and we're building it and growing it as we speak. I've got some courses that are coming out that haven't been out yet, and you're going to want to sign up when Apologia does this thing. But it's about educating people, giving them what I was never told in church, what I was never told in these apologetic arenas and circles by Ravi Zacharias, by William Lane Craig. None of them ever told us this material, and I want people to know it so you can actually have the privilege of taking these classes by these scholars. So help Paul out. Sign up for a course. Go down in his links. I'm telling you that you won't regret it. I've got stuff that's all, all sorts of good stuff coming. Get ready, baby. Get ready. And of course, if you've yet to subscribe to Myth Vision Podcast... You need to fix that today, as it's the channel that's actually exposing the intellectual side of Christianity. I learn so much every time. All right. Well, that was it for Dr. Craig today. Perfect. I hope it gets a lot of attention, and I hope he responds to it. And we'll get another responseception going. If you want to hear more of me and my guests taking on the apologetics of Dr. William Lane Craig, tap on the playlist on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later. <laughs>